What is happening every time for the first like normal MLB live before lock. So the new schedule that we have going forward been out telling you guys on shows, but just so you know, like what we're going to be doing on a normal weekday basis going forward. We've got the NBA strategy still so 10 a.m. for the NBA strategy show, but then 11 a.m. That's going to be the MLB strategy show. Then we get into the uh, nighttime. That's when deep dive now replaced by MLB live before lock. That'll be from five to six. Then NBA live before lock, the normal six to seven time slot. And then of course, afterwards, I'll be hopping in there over with Josh on playback, doing the playback stuff, doing the watch along, be watching basketball games, reacting to any kind of late breaking news, that kind of stuff. So as you guys are watching this, do me a favor, like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel and uh, joined here by Matt Bellman, our first time doing a baseball show together this year. Matt's first show of the season. He was in uh, Florida the last couple of days, but he is back in his uh, normal steady place there in Ohio. Matt, what is what's happening, man? Nothing. I'm sure you never thought you'd hear someone say it feels so good to be back in Cleveland, but here we are. Um, it feels good. I'm home. I'm pumped to do this show with you. You know that I've been hounding you about baseball shows, so really happy to be on here talking some MLB. And before we even get in, 650 lock, so just everyone know that going in. Yeah. Yeah, and there's super weird lock times for baseball this year, which also makes scheduling for me kind of a nightmare because I never know when these slates are going to lock because baseball teams now, in an effort to grow the MLB, they've decided part of that means teams just schedule their home games whenever the hell they want. And for some reason, it's beneficial to the game of baseball. Instead of starting games at 7 o'clock, you start at like 6.35 Eastern time, and all of a sudden the fans, they just come flocking in because of that 25-minute difference, at least according to baseball. So... I don't know what this is going to mean for lock times. Today it's locking at 6.50. Does it mean that we're normally going to start at 7 or some of these slates going to start at 6.35? Don't know. But good shout out by Matt that, yeah, it is an odd 6.50 start time. So be aware of that. And both DraftKings and FanDuel locking the same times. The worst case scenario for me is if FanDuel and DraftKings, like yesterday, just all start scheduling slates at different times because that's a total scheduling nightmare for uh, for myself, setting up the schedule. But for today, we're going to be uh, breaking down the eight game slate. Did you, uh, were you able to play on opening day? Or were you busy in Florida? I played. Um, it was okay. Uh, I stacked Washington. They were not okay. good. I stacked them with the Dodgers. They were good. Um, mm -hmm. Lizardo, the Lizardo lack of win kept me out of the money in my best lineup in the 555. So oh, that's tilting. Yeah, it was awful. Um, I don't know why I said it was decent because that felt awful. I, the lineup <laughs> cashed in the other contest, so it was like, okay, but still, it did not feel good. I'm looking to redeem myself tonight. Um, yeah, like when the chalk stacks, like the reds go off, diamondbacks on the night slate, those usually aren't going to be the slates that I'm successful on. And it was kind of a, a weird, even for the reds, it was kind of a weird slate because the reds were the absolute chalk of the day. And the chalkiest reds were terrible. Like the chalkiest reds didn't do anything. Like Jaime Condelario, like nothing. Uh, Ellie De La Cruz, nothing. Christian Encarnacion on Strand, nothing. But then it was like end of the order guys, like Nick Martini. He ends up hitting a couple of homers at like super low ownership. So yeah, even like if, if you stack the reds as a super chalk team, like the individual hitters that did well, it just wasn't the chalkiest one. So it's definitely a little bit of a tricky slate to navigate. What was not tricky to navigate though, was the pitching yesterday because in general if you roster a reasonable starting pitcher they scored like 19 to 25 fantasy points every pitcher was pretty decent yesterday but uh today could be a different story there are uh definitely some uh different outlooks on pitcher with being day two of the season where we don't have quite the same studs that are on the mound and as a result ownership super spread out which i'm interested by because i think that the ownership should be a little bit more condensed to pitch than what it is there's some spots that i like a lot more than the field does where the fields is apparently just seeing a lot of these guys as being fairly even so that's what matt and i are going to be breaking down if you guys got questions for us super chats you could throw those in and then of course if you're a member at stochastic at me in the discord channel I'll be answering your questions as we go here always happy to answer any questions whether they are strategy related which i think there might be more of those than normal considering it's only the second slate of the season or if you guys just want to have questions, you know, specific to this slate, which players were on, those sorts of things, you can throw those questions into the Discord channel as well. Uh, any other thoughts in general before we start getting into some of the pitchers? You touched on it a little bit, and it's in. it'll lead us into the pitchers. It's interesting, and I don't know, I, I was kind of taken aback when I looked at the pitching options today, like when I first opened the slate, how much of a downgrade they are from yesterday. Like, the, the drop down from the aces that were on the hill yesterday to today is real. I mean, there's a lot of question mark pitchers on this slate. Not a lot of gas cans. It's still like day two of the season. So teams are generally throwing their number two option. But 
there are certainly question marks among the, this group of pitchers. And I didn't really think that was the case yesterday. Yeah. And uh, we'll start with the high end pitchers where we've got a handful of expensive pitchers to talk about. And we'll kind of group these guys together by their DraftKings prices and uh, figure out what we want to do with them. And then also we'll talk about their FanDuel ownerships here as well. DraftKings and FanDuel always end up being uh, quite a bit different. When we talk about pitchers because the single pitcher versus the uh, two pitcher site. Here's what I'm most struck by looking at some of the DraftKings ownership to start here, Matt. We've got four pitchers that are 9K or more expensive. Bobby Miller, Joe Musgrove, Merrill Kelly, George Kirby. And they're all projected, other than Bobby Miller, slightly less ownership, 13.4%. The other these guys are kind of close together. we got Bobby Miller at 19%, Merrill Kelly at 28%, George Kirby at 25%. I strongly prefer one of these guys to the other three, which makes me a little bit confused by the ownership, but maybe you see it differently. So I want to know from you, which pitcher do you like the most if you're paying up for one guy? I don't love any of these guys. I think the best option is Kelly because he's in the best spot, like by far, but I don't love spending 9,400 on him against the Colorado team that will probably suck, but there's a lot of unknowns at the beginning of the season. Kirby is the best pitcher of the bunch in my mind. Hate the matchup, though. Boston's lineup is good in my eyes. Probably the best lineup of the four. Um, I think you can say the same thing about Miller. And then I, Musgrove also looks good here. So I don't see it the same as you, or I think one guy clearly stands out. I'm interested to hear who that guy is for you. It's Merrill Kelly for me. So Kelly had the best year of his career last year. He also saw a big uptick in his strikeout rate. It was in the mid-20% range, but it's also the matchup. This Colorado Rockies team is just not good at all. I talked about this on the strategy show this morning with Lafay as well. Never seen anything like this. We had the Rockies sitting around plus 300 to have the worst record in baseball yesterday. Game one of 162 game season, they were so bad and people were flocking to bet them to have the worst record in baseball so aggressively that on FanDuel, they went from plus 300 before the season started to plus 190 by like the third inning of their first game of the year where people are like, this is abhorrent. I have to bet again. It's a crazy overreaction, but it goes to show just how bad this, uh, this, this team is and what people think of them. But it's also always been the case that the Rockies have always fielded teams and they have a fairly similar offense this year to what they had last year. And this should also always be something expected. The Rockies, they're going to be considerably worse on the road than they are at home. And they're also always a team that are worse against right-hand pitching than left-hand pitching. They always build teams where it's like they like their big off season signing last year, Chris Bryant, big splits, much better hitter against lefties than righties. And this is a team that once again, is just going to get destroyed by right-hand pitching. They're going to get destroyed by right-hand pitching on the road. They're going to strike out a lot against righties. And you look at the other matchups for these expensive starters, and you got George Kirby against Boston, fairly difficult matchup. Joe Musgrove against the Giants, also not the easiest matchup in the world. Chris, uh, uh, Bobby Miller against the St. Louis Cardinals, also not the easiest matchup in the world. So I do think that of these pitchers, George Kirby is the most talented, but the matchup for George, for Merrill Kelly is so much easier than the matchup George Kirby has. You also look at our top pitcher odds. We've got Merrill Kelly with the best over odds being the uh, top two pitcher on this slate. So Merrill Kelly, people are going to ask about cash games. Play Merrill Kelly in cash, whether you're playing on DraftKings or FanDuel. He's my favorite payoff option for tournaments as well. Yeah, I get that. I mean, I have no arguments with him here. The Rockies will more likely than not be putrid because they're running out the same team they did last year, more or less. So I get the Kelly play for sure. You're paying for it. So like, you're not going to see Merrill Kelly higher than 9,400 too often. So like you're paying top price for him, but that doesn't really matter because, you know, Pitching is, is so much more projectable than hitting. Hitting is usually what wins tournaments, except if you get no hitters, outlier performances that generally don't happen. So that makes sense. I do think that the clear cash game pairing is Kelly and AJ Pook. And I like both those guys at tournaments. I mean, Puke looks amazing from a, a price per dollar, a points per dollar perspective at 7K in this matchup. Sure, there's question marks, but I think it's really, really hard to get away from him. But we'll get to him. Yeah, so uh, as far as the high end goes, that's where I'm going to be prioritizing Merrill Kelly. And I mean, the same goes for FanDuel as well on a single pitcher site, especially over on FanDuel when you get stuff like the quality start bonus and the win bonus. They carry so much more weight over on FanDuel. Merrill Kelly is one of the safest pitchers on the slate that we have to pick up when Dimebacks big favorites as they should be in this matchup against the Rockies. And Dimebacks, this was, you know, it's a contender this year. Their team that went to the World Series last year. So 
I really do like this spot for Merrill Kelly. I view him as a very good and a safe payoff option. The ownership, not insane. You know, 28% is the most uh, second most popular on the slate behind AJ uh, Puka right now, but a very minor difference between the two. But there's no crazy chalk at pitcher. It tends to be a little bit spread out. Anything else you want to say as far as the uh, payup options? No, but I do think, and I know you talk about this, like in single entry, higher dollar stuff, I think the ownership on Kelly will be increased just because even me, who doesn't love Kelly at 9,400, when you asked me that question, I said he was the best option just because I don't love any of the other options either. People love using pitchers against Colorado and it's worked. So I see nothing wrong with it. Got a question here in Discord is from Hey, I'm Drew. He wants to know who he should play be playing in cash games today. So uh, starting at pitcher, and uh, by the way, Hey, I'm Drew plays over on DraftKings, Matt. So if I'm talking about pitchers to play in cash games for DraftKings, I'm going to say uh, AJ Pook and Merrill Kelly as your combination to go to. Uh, Logan Allen, also somebody who I think is in consideration there. But considering the current weather concerns, that that's something I feel a little bit better going towards the uh, puke and the Kelly combination as more of a, a safer way to avoid some of the weather. Those three are your three cash game considerations, in my opinion. I'm with you. I think it's Kelly and puke, puke. And then Logan Allen is an interesting pivot because, you know, all of a sudden, if he does better than, than even in cash games, you still, you know, want to cash. So you, you want to, you can get different in a couple spots. And I think Logan Allen is viable, but the third option, as you mentioned. And then as far as offenses go, you load up on the Diamondbacks in cash. Even in tournaments, I think you make, uh, the, the Diamondbacks are the team when I run everything to the Sims, I get the most exposure to the Diamondbacks. So for 150 max setting, I do think the Diamondbacks, even though the most popular team on the slate, I actually do think they're going a little bit underrepresented. Single entry is probably going to end up being a different story, but for large field tournaments or for cash games, play yourself a lot of Diamondbacks. Load up on the Diamondbacks uh, stacks there. And then for cash games, uh, Pook and then uh, Merrill Kelly, as far as pitchers are concerned. Let's talk about these guys in the 8K range because there are pitchers picking up ownership here, Matt, that I don't really totally understand in the context of this slate. Like, Chris Bassett has 12% ownership against the Rays at $8,600. Nick Pavetta at yeah. 25% ownership against the Mariners. Like I don't think Pavetta is bad or anything. It is a pitcher-friendly ballpark, but this seems like a crazy amount of ownership to me against a pretty good offense. He's on the road. Well, once again, it is a pitcher's park. Still, he is going to be on the road against a good offense. Pavetta is good, but not great. I don't understand this 25% ownership. We have him being way over-owned in the top pitcher school. I don't totally understand it, but I understand it slightly more than you simply because I don't like Merrill Kelly as much as you. And there aren't like safe options outside of him. So I think that's why you're seeing ownership being scattered around. I think that he's certainly getting too much love and he's probably not a guy I play. Um, but there is strikeout upside at 8,100. So I don't think it's like the worst play in the world. Like, yeah, he is getting over owned, but he also has a higher top two pitcher percentage than. Miller and Musgrove and Bassett. So I don't hate it in that regard, but I do agree with you. He's getting too much love. And I think you can easily go elsewhere. Like Pavetta is just the guy. I don't know like what the Mariners are yet. I think they have a lot of potential to be a good offense. I also see strikeouts in that lineup. So, you know, I think that's one where I kind of want to see a little bit more from Seattle before I make a firm judgment on who and what they are. And one other issue that I have with Pavetta $8,100 is there's a handful of pitchers priced below him, like Poop talked about him, uh, Logan Allen, assuming the weather, if that ends up being good there. Like, I even, even if these guys were the same price point, I'd prefer to get to some of these guys. Instead, like, Logan Allen is $700 less expensive than Nick Pavetta. We have better projections on Logan Allen than Nick Pavetta, and Pavetta is less popular. So, I, I mean, I know that some of that's influenced by the weather situation, but uh, if everything ends up checking out there, yeah, I much prefer Logan Allen over Nick Pavetta. And then same for Chris Bassett. I don't really want to pay up for an $8,600 Chris Bassett at double-digit ownership either. I definitely am with you on Logan Allen. If that weather, if weather's not an issue, I think he is definitely the better play than Pavetta. Um, I don't love him either, but that's just a price play. He's too cheap. 
Anything else? We got Christian Javier here. I mean, those are really your uh, your 8K guys. And these guys are also kind of comparably priced over on FanDuel and same deal. I mean, Nick Pavetta, $8,500 on FanDuel. No thanks there. Uh, Chris Bassett's all up to $9,100. Still somehow 7% owned for Chris Bassett at $9,100 on FanDuel. Don't really have any interest in that. This is It's a price range I'm not all that interested in. Same. Javier looks decent from like a leverage perspective. He looks good from a leverage perspective. He was pretty good in the spring, lost a bunch of weight, you know, came into camp much better shape. So if you were in a different matchup, I'd have more interest, just not really the spot. I want to use him against the Yankees. So yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah, and uh, Ryan Rennebaum wants to know, can we talk about uh, Pook and Kelly for uh, Fandle? Yeah, t- I did talk about Kelly on Fandle. He's my favorite overall pitcher for Fandle. I mentioned that he's so safe there with the quality win bonus and the uh, and the win bonus just being two things that play bigger roles on Fandle. Well, obviously, the quality start bonus more important on Fandle because it doesn't exist on DraftKings. But yeah, he's my overall favorite pitcher to get to over on Fandle. Favorite pitcher for me on DraftKings as well if I'm paying up in Merrill Kelly. And then we've got a couple of other questions that are coming into us from Discord. This one is from uh, BBC in Mouth 8. Okay, that's an interesting Discord handle that he went with. So anyway, once again, this is a BB, uh, BBC GC in Mouth 8. Wants to know, uh, thoughts on five-man stacks with no secondary? Do you need a secondary stack for tournaments? No, you do, you, uh, you do not need to get to a secondary stack behind a five-man. So uh, I do now that uh, with access to the uh, Sims, I'm not exclusively playing five-man stacks because there are some times when I'm running stuff through the contest generator, it'll say that, hey, these this is a really good 4-4 four, four stack or really good, you know, like 4-3 stack or anything like that. So uh, I'm not going to exclusively be playing five-man stacks I had in the past. But if you are running a five-man stack, you, you don't have to play a three-man secondary stack, bring it back. No, I... You don't have to do anything in DFS. Like, I think all that, like, you have to do this, have to do that. Well, I do think you have to stack in large field tournaments. I wouldn't just play one-off single hitters. I wouldn't either, but I think that the optimal line on any given night is probably, you know, one-off hitters. So, I, like, again, I'm not saying, I agree with you. I think you need to stack an MLB. Um, But, like, as far as, like, the nuances of the stacks – I think that that's actually a good way to get different is instead of using a three man stack with your five man, do a two one or do all one offs. Because at that point, like it's very unlikely if you're using a chalky stack that someone's going to have, you know, the lineup that you have, not that that's a big concern for MLB anyways, but the higher owned your guys are, the more of a concern that is. And uh, we did get a question in the YouTube chat. Humboldt wanted to know about the uh, offers we have right now. And yeah, we have a MLB entering the season offer. If you sign up using the link below in the promo code Dinger, you get 30% off any MLB package. So if you want to sign up for the MLB lineup generator, get 30% off on that. If you just want an MLB data package, get 30% off on that. If you want to sign up for the Sims tool, which is what I'm going to be using this year, get 30% off. And now we do have the contest generator for baseball. So right on our site, you could build all your baseball items. You could simulate all of them out. You don't have to go anywhere else. You can do everything right on our site. So sign up with the link below in the promo code Dinger. And then also, we had, I don't know if you saw this, Matt, flagship main contest on FanDuel, day one of the season. One of our subs won the 100K over on FanDuel. So uh, already off to a good start to the season. If you guys want to sign up for any of those packages that we have below and yeah, maybe uh, win 100 bucks, uh, 100,000 uh, bucks like Hicks did last night, sign up using the link that we have below and uh, that promo code Dinger is going to get you 30% off. So uh, it's good for any baseball package. Uh, let's get to the pitchers here and uh, we'll talk about the cheap guys. And to me, this is where the slate really gets interesting because every pitcher we've talked about so far is carrying some amount of ownership. But once you get to the cheap end, while there are popular pitchers, there are interesting contrarian talking points as well. But let's start with the popular guys, Logan Allen, AJ Puck. And when it comes to Allen, he, to me, is a very strong option. The question just becomes, what is the weather going to be? People are asking in chat, will the game play? As of right now, it's kind of hard to know. It's up in the air. I would say it's 50-50. We're going to need more information later. I can't confidently tell you it's going to play. I can't confidently tell you it's going to be canceled. We just need more information closer to lock. Do you have a better read on the weather than I do at the moment? I don't. um, I think there's definitely concerns here. And with eight games in play, like – 
if I were multi-entering and playing 150, I wouldn't take them out of my pool, certainly, at least not yet. But as someone who's playing three lineups, like I probably won't use Logan Allen because I think he looks really good if the weather holds, but the weather's uncertain. And I don't think he looks like great. I have just overall concern for them. He's my least favorite of the Guardians, like young pitchers. I don't think he's bad but I don't love him either. I get it. The spot's really good. It's kind of like the poor man's Kelly, to be quite honest. Yeah. And as far as what the weather is right now as well, I'm using, you know, my, my trusty weather source, google.com. And uh, according to, uh, to what Google is saying here, we've got a 57% chance of rain throughout the night. So, you know, it's not something where it, des- it necessarily means that it has to rain the entire day. I would say this, it is very risky. If you're somebody who wants to be risk adverse, just don't play this game and maybe go to a puck instead of Allen as your, as your favorite source to save money with. For sure. I will say like, to your point though, assuming the weather holds and it's not like this game is, you know, red, it's looking iffy, but who knows? Like the, the guardians bats look really sneaky and Logan Allen looks good. So there's, I think a lot of merit in tournaments for keeping a close eye on this game. Yeah. It's totally reasonable to uh, just, want to avoid it and just look somewhere else. So uh, as as far as I'm concerned, I'm okay with leaving Allen in lineups, but it's something I'm definitely going to be reassessing in the next hour or so. And at the very least, I I will likely at least downgrade his exposure a little bit. The, easier, the easiest way to do that in The Sims, by the way, guys, is on the uh, ROI boost, you could go into, you could select Logan Allen, you could do like a 15 to 20% negative ROI boost where it won't necessarily mean you get to 0% of them. Although if you do want to aggressively downgrade and take them out, that's also something you could do, but it will make it so you do get a uh, quite a bit less exposure than what you uh, would normally do. So that's a good way to kind of minimize your risk with him while still having some exposure to him. So with that in mind, AJ Puck, that is the uh, guy who I think is the best overall option we have for cheap. I do like him more on DraftKings than FanDuel. The main issue I have with him on FanDuel is that this is going to be the first start of AJ Puck's career. He's always been a reliever. He's transitioning to a starter. And there are some concerns with how deep he's going to go into the game. At his price point on DraftKings, it's less of a concern. If he doesn't get a win bonus, doesn't get a quality start, he could sort of have a good game at his DK price point. But on FanDuel, if he only goes four innings, he's probably dead to be in the optimal lineup. Yeah, with only one pitcher, I agree with you. The the risks... The rewards don't outweigh the risks, I should say. Yeah, and uh, also Mod Dub T says, what happens if they don't play? So if they don't play, one of two things is going to happen. If the game gets canceled before it's scheduled start time, you could still swap off of it. But if the game already locks and then it gets canceled, then you just get zeros for those players. So risk. Uh, There's always risk with weather. It's something we have to deal with in MLB that we don't have to in NBA and uh, Trill Fade asked, no NBA today. Yeah, NBA shows right after this schedule now is uh, MLB show from 5 to 6, NBA show from uh, 6 to 7. That's going to be the uh, schedule on most days here going forward. And I think we had one other question in chat. Where did it go? Oh, here it is. Gator Nation 850 said, thanks for all the MLB help. He said, for FanDuel, do I like 4-3-1 better for 25 lineups? Uh, okay, so... People are not going to like this answer, but it's the right answer, unfortunately. People want there to be one size fits all answer for every single slate where it's like, I build this exact lineup every single day and it is the way to go. But now that we have, you know, the different tools on the sites like the Sims or just, you know, other tools like the lineup generator, for instance, if you're using the lineup generator, here's what I think you should do do all lineup types and you get a mix of different lineups you can look at. I don't necessarily think there's one lineup that has to be the best build for every single night. Sometimes for FanDuel, it's going to be a 4-4. Sometimes it's going to be a 4-2-2. There's different lineups that are going to be different looking depending on what stacks and players are available. So I recommend Gator Nation. You play with the tools and see which different kinds of lineups you get to, which ones project the best. But I don't think there's just one lineup that you have to build for every single slate. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, That was kind of my point when I was talking earlier about like not stacking or not having rules. It's that like... You don't, if one slate, you know, every slate is is independent of the next slate. So you kind of got to look at them as such. As far as AJ Pooh goes, he was really, really good this spring. Um, struck out a ton of guys, only allowed two runs. Both those runs came in his last outing. It was against Houston, so that's okay. Still struck out eight there. Um, he's way too cheap. 
I think there's certainly merit in like going to the other side of this and stacking Pittsburgh against him. But the ownership's there on Pittsburgh. They are pretty high on the top stacks tool. So this is one where I don't think you have to play Puke or the Pirates, but both sides look really, really good in tournaments. And uh, a couple things. First, uh, a welly way was asking where my MMA video is. Yeah, I, uh, I, I recorded it right before this show. It, it should be up on the YouTube channel shortly. And then one other thing I also wanted to speak on, because Crispy Ring Talk said that if the game locks, they will uh, refund you if you don't have time to change it. Uh, no, they will not usually no. do that. If you if you have lineups where the game gets canceled and you take a zero, you're probably losing for the night. They will not refund on weather for MLB. Like, yeah. no so way. what might happen is maybe you have other good players in the lineup caches, like min cash or something like that. But yeah, you're typically going to be drawing dead. So that is a risk to be aware of when it comes to baseball. As far as uh, another question that we got here in the uh, in the Discord, Elway's Army said, do the Sims take weather into consideration? So it'll take things like wind into consideration, but as far as rain, it's not like there's something in there that's going to project the odds of a game being canceled. Yeah, if there was, I mean, it would be everywhere. Yeah. Like, there's nothing that's impossible, so yeah. And then uh, once again, our guy, but this is, uh, I can tell this is quickly going to become one of my favorite Discord characters for the season because uh, BBC, uh, GC, and Mouth uh, 8 uh, once again has a follow. I like also how it's 8. It's like, it's because the the BBC in, in Mouth uh, 1 through 7 were already taken, so we had to settle on 8 there. <laughs> so uh, anyway, our guy here says, he wants to know why is he getting to so much D-backs in The Sims? Uh, I think for large field tournaments, that is the best team to stack by a pretty wide margin for a couple of reasons. We're going to talk more about stacks in a second when we get there, uh, but yeah, just that's my favorite team to stack on the slate. That's why the Sims are giving them to you so much. Yeah, for sure. One more thing about uh, AJ Puke. I do think that a lot of people saw what Garrett Crochet did yesterday and are like, this is the same exact play. And it is really similar, but it doesn't mean it's going to work out the exact same. Yeah, and um, by the way, people in chat really liking our uh, our friend in Discord here. So also... Boy, another one. Boy, everybody's asking about the UFC video. Uh, B, is this like a bit at this point? Everybody has to ask me where the UFC video is. Uh, because uh, B Threedle uh, Bump God asked if we're getting a UFC show. Yeah, it's recorded. I actually just uh, messaged Nathan, who posts our videos, and he just stepped out for a little bit, just got back, and he's going to be posting stuff now. Uh, but uh, anyway, talking about the rest of the pitchers here, I do think there are some interesting contrarian options. So I want to know from you. Who is your favorite sub K contrarian pitcher to roster as an SP2? Sub 8K, you said? Sub 8K. So anybody, I mean, pretty much everybody below 8K that isn't uh, Logan Allen or isn't AJ Puck is relatively contrarian. Do you have one guy in this price range, sub 8K, that you're liking to be contrarian? I have one. I talked about a little bit this morning. Makes me uncomfortable, but I, I do think there's pretty good reasoning for it. I mean, yours has got to be Carlos Rodon, yeah. and I agree with that. I think you could also say Martin Perez. Like, I don't think he looks as good, a lot cheaper, also coming in with nice leverage. So those would be the two guys. Uh, talk up Rodon. So for me, when it comes to Carlos Rodon, uh, one of two things is going to happen this year. Either he's going to bounce back. Because remember, there was a year ago, this guy was considered like the commodity on the free agent market. He was the best starting pitcher that, well, short of like Jacob DeGrom. But like once we got to past DeGrom being signed, like Carlos Rodon was a very sought after free agent. And for good reason. He was a Cy Young candidate in back-to-back -back seasons. And then last year he got hurt, which is not uncommon for Carlos Rodon. He does get hurt all the time. But at least the last few years, he'd been very good when he was a healthy pitcher. And by very good, like legitimately one of the best pitchers in baseball, he gets hurt last year, never had a good season, wasn't able to get into rhythm. Even when he did have a good start or two, he would just get hurt again and go right back to the, to the injured list. He'd come back. So he was never able to start. It was, I don't even think he had like four starts in a row last year without getting hurt. He was constantly on the injured list, long-term absences. So he has this terrible year and he might just be washed. He's 31 years old. He's a lot of injuries in his career. It is very possible that he's not a good pitcher anymore. It's also possible that he was just hurt last year and he's going to go back to being the pitcher he was a couple years ago. 2022 with the Giants. 
2.88 ERA, 2.64 expected ERA. 2021 with the White Sox, 2.37 ERA, 2.68 expected ERA. A, a season that still really tilts me because I bet him at 75 to win Cy Young, and then they shut him down at the end of the year to get him healthy for the playoffs. He would have won Cy Young that year had they just kept him healthy going to the playoffs. But unfortunately, the AL Central was so dog shit that year. The White Sox were up by like 15 games. They just didn't have to pitch their guys in the second half of the season. That aside, Carlos Rodon goes from being an elite pitcher to getting hurt, and now people have just totally written him off. And I'm not confident that he gets back to being what he was, but what I do think is that it's live to happen, and the field is assuming there's 0% chance it happens because he is 2% owned on a small slate without elite starting pitching, and he's very cheap. So I agree with most of what you said. The only thing I'll say is I'm not sure that people are completely giving up on him. Like I did a couple big season long drafts and yeah, he went way later than obviously he did last year, but he still got picked, you know, as a middle round SB. I think tonight it's just the matchup. And this is a perfect example of like, if I didn't watch MLB and I didn't know anything about MLB and I just used the tools, which is probably the best way to play. I'd be all over Rodone because he's, got so much leverage i mean a ton a ton of leverage here and he's a guy that can strike out a lot of guys so i get it unfortunately i do follow mlb and this is just not the spot i want to pick on you know pick on houston hardly ever um the strikeout upside is minimal here just because it's houston the downside is massive like I do get it in tournaments just because he's getting no ownership. It's just a play that the tools love. And sometimes you just have to believe in the tools and just play guys like that. Yeah. And it's also, I was running my lineups this morning. I got myself to 4% of Carlos Rodon. That's double the field. Like it's just somebody who's so easy to get overweight to the field. If you play 20 lineups and Carlos Rodon's in one of them, you're you're twice the field on him. Like that's the way I'm kind of looking at him as a contrarian tournament option. If you're not only playing the chocolate pitcher, I think he's somebody to consider as a uh, contrarian option. But for you, anybody else do you have your eye on as somebody we should be looking at? I mentioned Martin Perez. Um, He was actually really good this spring. Again, it's spring training. It doesn't matter. But people have this like propensity to want to pick on Martin Perez. I don't know. Not usually a guy I want to stack against. And he showed some strikeout upside. It's a good ballpark. Like, you know, like I said at the beginning, there are no sure things on this slate. And I like AJ Pook a lot more. Obviously, he's got much higher strikeout upside. But I can also see this type of slate being one where, like, if you get 15 points from your pitcher, you're happy. And all of a sudden, if Perez does that and, like, Pittsburgh hits Puke hard, you're in a really good spot. So he's the other guy, Martin Perez. Let's see if there was any other questions about pitchers that came into Discord. Uh, nope. And, uh, yeah, our, our BBC friend, he did not ask any uh, follow-up questions. We will get to the uh, <laughs> hitters here in a second. And don't forget, if you guys want access to the Discord channel, just sign up for any of our baseball packages using the links that we have below. Uh, before we talk about the stacks, Matt, anything else you want to talk about as far as the pitchers are concerned? No, it is interesting that, like, all the bottom guys in the top pitcher tool are coming in with nice leverage. Um, and all the top guys are over So, you know, I don't usually try to differentiate with pitchers too much because I think they're so projectable. I'd rather do that with hitters. But this does strike me as a type of slate where I wouldn't fault anyone who like really wanted to play Arizona, for instance, and just playing them with like a Carlos Rodon. Yeah, and for single entry, well, because and I, we could start by talking about pitchers, uh, or sorry, we could start by talking about the Diamondbacks when it comes to stacks here. Because this is a team that I do view quite a bit differently in single entry as opposed to large field tournaments. Because when I run everything through the Sims for, you know, like building out uh, 5,000 lineups and simulating the slate, I get to a ton of Diamondback stacks because when they are projected for 13% ownership, but we have them with 14% top stack odds, they look like the best overall team to roster in large field tournaments on both DraftKings and FanDuel. Where it's different, though, is going to be single entry, where I assume that like 13% ownership on the Diamondbacks is going to be like 25% single entry. It's something I know that you play a lot of like the higher dollar fields and also play a lot of the single entry type stuff, Matt. And it's something that it's hard to put like an actual number on what the ownership is going to be sometimes these single entry, but it's something you and I over the last you know year or so have had conversations about, and you just kind of know from playing these contests, the Diamondbacks are going to be way more popular in single entry fields than in large field tournaments. So while I love them in large field tournaments and why our guy BBC before was asking why he's getting to so much of uh, Diamondbacks, it's because they're the best team to stack in large field tournaments. For single entry, 
Are you concerned about what their ownership may be? Do you also suspect they could be very popular there? Very concerned. Yeah, I'm in total agreement with you. Last night in the night slate, there was only three games. In the 333, they were projected to be like, I think about 30% owned. They were all like 50% owned. They were chalk last night in, you know, again, I think Quantrill's worse than Freeland. There's more games tonight, um, but they are easily the top stack on the board in my mind. And I think that everyone will see it that way. They're not expensive. They're facing a trash pitcher. One of the only few like not good SBs on the slate. There's a lot of other guys that have a lot of risk attached to them. But Quantrill is, in my mind, the worst pitcher on the slate against one of, if not, you know, they're not the best offense. They're certainly not better than the Dodgers. But Arizona is good. I mean, you said it like they went to the World Series last year. They added pieces this year. I know they just signed Jordan Montgomery. They signed Eduardo Rodriguez. They got Ennio Hendo Suarez to play third. Um, like this team is good. And they're in a really good spot here against Quantrill. Very concerned about it in single entry, but I think there are ways to get around it. Like I said, I do think this is the type of slate where you could play Arizona and, you know, mix up your pitchers a little bit. I think if you're playing like Kelly, Puke, and Arizona, you're just, I just don't think that's going to win tournaments tonight. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean, it's it's going to be definitely a different strategy for me, large field tournaments versus single entry. And that is, uh, I think, the the next thing we could talk about is what is our favorite overall low-owned stack to target in single entry if we aren't going to Arizona? Because, you know, I do think that we should be implementing different strategies in single entry fields versus large field tournaments. But if the slate was locking right now, given the information that we have with with ownership, is there one team that you like targeting above all of the others for single entry? Probably the Dodgers. Um, like full stack in the Dodgers, I don't think is going to be that popular because they're really expensive. Arizona looks better. Um, I mean, the Dodgers showed it yesterday. Like they can put up runs probably better than any team in baseball. You know, them and the Braves. So facing Zach Thompson, who's certainly got question marks. Like the Dodgers will get love, but not a ton of it. They won't be the highest owned team on the slate. And I think after Arizona, there is no team I'm worried about their ownership. How about you? So the one other team that I could also see getting to be very, very popular, which kind of makes me want to consider Carlos Rodon more. I think the Astros are going to be very popular. I think the Astros and Marlins. I think the Marlins are also going to be popular. Yes. Uh, And Diamondbacks overall in single entry, I, I do think that's the team the field is going to be gravitating the most towards. Uh, but yeah, if you mentioned before, if, if you're playing the Dimeback stacks with Rodon on a pitcher, then there's no ownership concerns at all on that kind of combination. Uh, but as far as other teams I'm concerned about the ownership, like I don't think the Houston Astros ownership is going to be so high to be concerned about it. For single entry, the only team I think that could be like outrageously popular is the Diamondbacks. Yeah, agreed. I think that certainly other teams will be overowned, Houston and Miami. Um, but not to a point where I'm like concerned about it, especially if you're not playing those teams with Arizona. My favorite overall team to stack on the slate, all things being considered, ownership, price point, it's New York Yankees. The reason it's the New York Yankees is because, and if, if you guys listened to the strategy show this morning, you've kind of uh, heard me go over some of Christian Javier's numbers. He's a solid pitcher. Wasn't as good last year as he was two years ago. Was fine though. Four point five six ERA, four point four two expected ERA. Where you get concerned about Christian Javier if you're somebody who likes the Houston Astros, everything gets hit in the air against them. He's a twenty five point six percent ground ball rate. I don't know the ground ball rates of every single qualified starting pitcher this year. Javier's might have been the lowest. If it wasn't the lowest, it's a, it's one of the lowest. And one thing you almost never see with pitchers that are this extreme of fly ball pitchers. They almost never have league average home run to fly ball rates, which Christian Javier does. He gives up a shit ton of home runs. This is a problem against the New York Yankees. If you are a pitcher that allows a lot of fly balls and a lot of home runs, that is potential recipe for disaster against the Yankees. Now, Javier is, once again, a quality starting pitcher. He's far from the worst starting pitcher on the slate. But there is very minimal ownership going to the Yankees, and we know what that upside looks like in that lineup, especially now with Juan Soto in the mix. 
I would not be surprised at all if the Yankees are the highest scoring team on the slate. It makes sense for me looking at the top stacks tool. It makes sense for me when I was running lineups through the Sims. It also makes sense if I just look at the numbers available on Christian Javier and the advanced stats and what his ground ball rate is and the amount of home runs that he allows. So I think there's immense upside in the Yankees. The field is just not getting there. Another team also for single entry, I don't expect them to really carry any ownership. Yeah, I like the Yankees a lot. I think you're being nice to Javier. Like He was not great last year. He is a guy that gets up a ton of fly balls. I respect him more than his numbers would, you know, should deserve from last year. But again, he came into spring training in much better shape. So I'll give him the benefit of the doubt and say that both sides of this are in play in tournaments. Javier's also coming in with a lot of leverage, but my preferred side is the Yankees. And they do look like one of, if not the top tournament stack on the board, because the other thing about it is like, when the Yankees go off more times than not, they're hitting home runs. I mean, they've got a ton of power in their lineup. That's what you need to win tournaments. Um, you know, a team like Cleveland, for instance, who I like here against Ross Stripling and not going to get much ownership facing a bad pitcher. Like a lot of times, like last night when they score eight runs, they didn't even hit a home run yesterday. Yeah. Uh, I didn't even I didn't even really uh, think about that looking through all of the uh, box scores of the individual teams. But yeah, I mean, there are other ways. I mean, if a team has a lot of speed and steals bases, sure. that's also possible. But it's also one of the benefits of stacking, because even if you don't get the home runs, if a team puts up eight, nine runs, you know, every time somebody gets on base, it's another at bat for somebody else in the lineup. It's an RBI opportunity. It's a run scoring opportunity. Somebody in the chat asked us, uh, Zeekster69, but we, we got names in the People have come out with the names in, in Discord for baseball this year. We got we got a BBC 8, and we got BBC in Mouth 8. We've got <laughs> Zeekster 69, and then a ton of emojis. So Zeekster 69 has a soccer ball, hockey stick, money, goat, crown, and then basketball emoji. And he wanted to know my preferred stack uh, for, uh, for DraftKings 4 or 5. It, it doesn't exclusively have to be 5. Like 4 or 4 lineups can make sense. 4 or 3 lineups can make sense. But in general, the lineups I play most predominantly are five because of how much correlation there is with stacks in baseball. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I think that the uh, New York Yankees, there's so much power upside there. If you ask me which team is most likely to hit multiple homers today, I'm going to tell you the New York Yankees. Yeah, I agree with you. Real quick, though, I want to get your opinion on two stacks. that the So one, the tools like from a leverage standpoint. The other, they don't really, but then when you take it for to the next level... I think there's a lot of leverage and that's Pittsburgh and Colorado. So Colorado is never going to look good and they don't look great here, but they are coming in with leverage and Merrill Kelly is getting a ton of ownership. So I think that with both Pittsburgh and Colorado, like it's worth mentioning, especially with Pittsburgh, probably like it's not just their top stack percentage and their ownership share that you have to look at because the opposing pitchers are getting a ton of love. You could say the same thing about like a Seattle stack. Oh my, by the way, uh, as, as a, uh, side note here. So something else I like about Seattle, it was something that uh Lofi and I were doing a little bit on the strategy show is we were showing people how to use the stack boosts in the Sims tool. If I was going to, uh, force the Sims to give me one more offense or to force myself to give me more of an offense, it is the Seattle Mariners because of the leverage you're getting on Nick Pavetta. We talked about before. I, I don't understand the ownership going to him. I think it's too high. And one of the easiest ways to get leverage off that is just by playing more of the Seattle Mariners. So that is definitely something that uh, I think makes sense to do. And then uh, guess who's back? The Philadelphia Phillies bullpen, because up 2 nothing going into the seventh inning, and now the Phillies are down 9-2. So a uh, different team. Some things never change, though. Uh, Eric T brings up a certainly viable point in the chat where he says, that was a whole different Javier. He might not be that guy anymore, to an extent. Because Christian Javier, while he has had better years in the past than he did last year. His makeup in terms of ground ball rate and home run and fly ball rate, that has always been the same. That has never changed. If you look at every single year of Christian Javier's career since he got called up to the big leagues in 2020, he has never had a ground ball rate higher than 30%, which is incredibly low. And he's always had a league average to above league average home run to fly ball rate, which if you're looking at what is the potential upside of the Yankee stack, I, even the best version of Christian Javier has always been a homer prone pitcher. Would you not agree with that, Matt? I would totally agree with that. Uh, anything else you want to talk about the uh, Yankees or Diamondback stacks? If not, we can look at uh, some of the other ownerships for stacks and how we want to approach them. Well, yeah, I do want to get your opinion on the Pittsburgh stack because I know our tools don't love them, but when you consider the puke ownership, and I think he's going to be really high owned in the single entry tight contest. So 
Like, what's your interest in a Pittsburgh stack? Knowing the tools don't love them from like a leverage standpoint, but they're decently high. Like they're upper half and you're getting that leverage off a of puke. So the problem I have with the with the Pirates is a couple of things. First, I do really prefer the puck side of the game in uh, in general as a pitcher. Like he's going to be somebody I have a lot of exposure to. When I was running lineups to the Sims, I wasn't really getting to very much of Pittsburgh. They're also popular. They're the fifth most popular offense on the entire slate. And also, it's Miami. This is a big ballpark. It's one of the five most pitcher-friendly ballparks in baseball. So I don't think it sets up all the well for power for the Pittsburgh Pirates, other than O'Neill Cruz, who's apparently all the way back now. A guy is homered like in every single game going back through spring training and did it yesterday as well. Apparently, he could hit homers wherever. But yeah, I don't think this is a great spot for the Marlins. I would feel different about it if people weren't playing them, but they are the fifth most popular offense on the slate. We've got the Marlins, the Dodgers, the Astros, the Those are the only teams more popular than the Pittsburgh Pirates. That's fair. I just think like you're also like taking out a ton of the field with, with puke if they happen to go off. Um, like the ownership isn't a concern for me. I do wish they were lower owned. Um yeah, I mean, the Yankees do look really, really good to me. They're my favorite stack. Javier was okay in spring training, but had a couple rough starts. So, yeah, I'm going to back off that take. Um, I'm with you on the Yankees. Yeah, so Yankees, uh, relative to ownership, that's my favorite low-owned team to get to large field tournaments. And for single entry, really like the Yankees. For large field tournaments, the, the Diamondbacks, it's an elite spot. People are bringing it up in the chat how much the uh, Sims are getting them to the Diamondbacks. Are there any offenses that you're looking at and you are concerned that their ownership may be too high. One of them for me is the Pittsburgh Pirates. And it's weird. It's very rare you get these slates where it's like the Pirates are super popular and and where you got actually every the, the Marlins offense is popular, the Pirates offense is popular, and AJ Puck is popular. You rarely see things this popular from any one game. But yeah, two teams that I am concerned about the ownership of the Marlins going up against Martin Perez, who isn't a great pitcher but he isn't somebody who typically yields massive games for fantasy purposes, doesn't give up a mass amount of home runs typically. And then also I don't love the Pirates against, uh, I don't I don't love the Pirates offense against uh, Puck either, just because I do think that he's a quality pitcher now transitioning to a starter role. Yeah, the only case for the Pirates is that if Puck is off, they're just capturing a lot of the field because a lot of people are going to have him. Um, but I'm with you though, like on paper doesn't look like a great spot and they're getting ownership. So not a team I'm going to consider. I'm not worried about their ownership, but there's just other teams that look better to me than they do. And as far as questions, let me just make sure we didn't miss anything there. And we did have one. Yeah, Einstein just asked, any interest in Pittsburgh? I think he did ask that before we started the uh, conversation. Here's where I would like Pittsburgh. This is like a total hypothetical. If Puck was this popular and there was no ownership going to the Pirates. It would be a different scenario, but they're the fifth most popular offense on the slate. So it's they're too popular for me. That's what kind of kills some of the leverage. I'm with you, but like just fifth most popular, like really, like I'd rather have them be the 10th most popular, but like, I just think there's so much leverage going against a chalk pitcher who's never made a start that again, I'm not going to play them, but I keep talking about them. So clearly yeah. I like them a little bit more than you. And uh, Kyle Krings in chat wants to know, are there any pitchers I'm concerned with the pitch count with? One thing that was uh, kind of tilting for me yesterday is we had data, not like, I mean, it's not like crazy data, but like pitchers made three, four spring training starts. And I thought that would be some sort of decent guideline for how many pitches we could expect from pitchers yesterday. It ended up having like no real correlation. There was guys who went deep in spring training games that didn't go deep yesterday. There was vice versa happened where somebody like, Logan Webb was limited to a top of 37 pitches in spring training. And then he was all of a sudden stretched out yesterday. The pitcher I'm most concerned about actually is AJ Puck in terms of pitch count. It's less of a concern for DraftKings than it is for FanDuel though, just because the pitching doesn't have the same amount of aces today as it did yesterday. And AJ Puck could certainly, he, he might pitch three innings and still could do enough damage because of his strikeout rates end up being in an optimal lineup. For FanDuel though, I actually, I would fade Puck on FanDuel just because of concerns about how deep you would go into games when you kind of do generally need six innings out of a starting pitcher on Fandle for them to be in a winning lineup. And I don't think that's likely in the cards for AJ Puck. But uh, any pitchers that you are looking at, whether it be DraftKings, Fandle, or just in general, that pitch count concerns, have you uh, wary of rostering them? No, um, I think that it's 
kind of like you said, more or less a guessing game at this point. And I think you're, you can drive yourself crazy, like looking into that stuff. And then it probably is not going to work out that way. Emac wants to know any concern about the Oakland versus Cleveland starting pitchers. Yeah, certainly concern. Uh, I do want it to be a little bit closer to lock before we can definitively say what the weather is going to be. It's something to keep an eye on though. If, if I was locking the slate right now, I wouldn't take the game out of my player pool but I would do an ROI boost to it to get less of it, a negative ROI boost to get a little bit less exposure to Logan Allen and some of the hitters in the game. Uh, but yeah, it's it's definite concern, but not concerned where I would take him out of my lineups entirely, at least as of now. Uh, as far as crazy contrarian stacks, are there any super low-owned offenses that you have your eye on for tonight, Matt? <sighs> uh, I hate saying this, but it's the Rockies. Like... They're coming in with nice leverage. They're going to be even lower owned than that. And Merrill Kelly's chalky. So this is another one where if I didn't know anything about baseball and I was just using the tools, mm-hmm. I'd probably be playing some Rodone with the Rockies. Like, you know what I mean? Because the tools just really like those sides. And I think, you know, a lot of the arguments for Rodone are similar to the Rockies. Like, I think you can make stronger arguments for Rodone for sure, because he's at least shown it in the past. But from a leverage standpoint, I think Colorado looks good. Again, I'm playing minimal lineup, so on an eight game slate, I probably won't get I, I won't get to Colorado, but they do stand out as like a leverage stack in multi entry type stuff. For me, it's the Seattle Mariners. Uh, talked about them a little bit before as well. It's just the team with the most leverage and also the easiest matchup, uh, in my opinion, amongst the pitchers who are actually really good that are picking up ownership. Like, I don't, I'm not inclined to stack against Merrill Kelly. I don't want to stack against Logan Allen, especially because he got those of the Oakland and the Colorado offenses. But uh, Seattle's actually a very good offense going up against a a middling pitcher, Nick Pavetta, who's picking up 25% ownership. So Seattle Mariners, to me, that's the sub 5% owned offense. That looks like the best overall leverage spot for me. Uh, Do you have any other leverage spots or low owned stacks you like, Matt? If not, we could uh, look for some uh, bets maybe that we might like, and we could do some uh, dong picks as well. People always like the dong picks. I got two more that I'll shout out that I like more than Colorado, just from a practical standpoint, Toronto, they were really good yesterday and they're not getting ownership today. And then St. Louis, like Bobby Miller is very good, but also very young and unproven. Um, You know, they faced glass now yesterday. Certainly Miller is a step down from that. I view St. Louis kind of like I view Seattle. I like both those teams from a uh, leverage standpoint, not getting ownership. I think Toronto looks act like actively good. The Toronto Blue Jays. Ah, it's kind of like a mediocre stack for me. Uh, when I was running, st- I got to like right in line with the field. It's like not a problem with them, but it wasn't, I wasn't like, there was no stands. I wasn't over underweight on them when I was running lineups. That's fair. And again, like I'm not, I haven't built my lineups yet, so I'm not going to sit here and say I'm going to use Toronto, but they do look like a team like in that mid tier, not getting a lot of ownership. They're another team like the Yankees, like they've got power in their lineup. So when they go off, they're going to hit home runs. And a sick Hemi sent me a DM. He wants to know uh, what I think about uh, Dodgers as a three man stack. So uh, kind of a similar situation to the Dodgers for me today as they were yesterday. I hardly got to any Dodgers five-man stacks, but they were my most rostered three-man stack of any team. I suspect that's going to be the case a lot for my lineups this season. The Dodgers are so expensive that I I have to think it's going to be hard to to make just a lot of five-man stacks of them. Something else also is uh, earlier today, any stacks that I did have of the Dodgers when I was going through the Sims, I noticed the pitching combination in all of them was A.J. Puck and uh, Logan Allen. And now if I'm going to be lowering my exposure to Logan Allen a little bit, that'll probably weed out some more of those Dodgers five-man stacks that I find difficult to get to. Three-man stacks, love them for three-man stacks because you could go Otani, Freeman, one of the cheaper hitters. You could go Betts. It's hard to go like five super expensive Dodgers bats, but if you get two of those guys with like a Chris Taylor or somebody towards the tail end of the lineup, that's where I really like getting to the Dodgers. So for uh, Sick Hemi asking me, if I had to choose one team to make a three-man stack of as a secondary stack, it would be the Dodgers. Uh, as far as five-man stacks go, are the price tags on the Dodgers too prohibitive for you, or you still think it's something that uh, will be easy enough to get to today? Certainly won't be easy. You're going to have to sacrifice a lot to get there. That's where a guy like Martin Perez comes in play for me. I don't think a lot of people will five-man stack the Dodgers because it's really hard to do. 
I love them in any type of scenario, three man, five man, one offs. Their lineup is just so good that they're not going to do amazing every day. But I think every day you play, like it's okay to have, it's okay to good to have Dodgers exposure. They're that good. Yep. Yep. It's not like if somebody had a five man Dodger stack, it's not like I would tell them, uh, delete that lineup. It's no good. Sure. It's it's just not going to be my preferred builds for today because of what some of those price points are there. Uh, but also only a couple minutes left to go here. So uh, before we hand it over to the guys on the live before lock, want to let you guys know that we do have our data all access back. You can sign up using the link below. We've also got our lineup generator bundle. And now is the best time to sign up for the bundle packages. We didn't talk about them a whole bunch a month or two months ago. And uh, one of the main reasons that we weren't really talking about a month ago is because the only main sport that was going on was basketball. But now if you sign up for a data all access package, you're getting baseball, you're getting basketball, you're getting hockey, you're getting MMA, you're getting PGA. USFL starts tomorrow. Matt Kajewski going to be doing USFL projections. So all of that is going to be bundled together. So if the Sims aren't for you and you just want data, we do have the data bundle package. You could sign up for that using the link we have below. Also, lineup generator bundle, you can get a good discount on that by getting the NBA and the uh and so you'll get nba mlb and pga all going on at the same time so bundled in the lineup generator package if you guys just want lineups built for you as well as some of the data that comes with that you can sign up for that bundle right now as well using the link that we have below but home run pick time matt who's the dong of the day who's going yard i'm gonna go glaber torres top of the lineup in that yankee stack um that's who i'm going with uh how about you so I am also going to go with my Yankees, my favorite team to stack today relative to ownership. So I feel like I should, if, if I already said that, I think the Yankees are the team most likely to hit a uh, home, to hit multiple home runs today. Makes sense that I would pick a Yankee for my home run pick of the day. How about Juan Soto for his first homer as a member of the New York Yankees going up against Christian Javier? I think Juan Soto ends up going yard for the first time as a New York Yankee. Uh, and then also, any any bets that you're liking for today? Anything that you're considering uh, putting some money on? I have not had enough time to look at the betting side outside of the NCAA tournament, but I do want to touch on chat real quick in playback. Okay. Giving me shit about the Rockies call. And, like, I get it. Like, I get it. I'm not playing the Rockies, and no one's going to ever sound good calling out the Rockies, and I don't think they do well here. But it reminds me of, like, the League of Legends stuff. When I first started playing, I knew nothing about any of these teams. I just would use the tools and the teams of the most leverage I would play. And I was very successful. And I think that you can do that in a lot of sports. Like oftentimes you can know too much and using the tools as like a straight guide isn't the worst thing in the world. That's my only shout out with the Rockies. Not that I think they're going to be the highest scoring stack on the slate or anything like that. And uh, we've got uh, Corey Randall uh, said, I don't know if I'm slow on the news, but we're shit my money. Yeah. Adam doesn't work here anymore, uh, but you can still follow him on Twitter, uh, Adam over uh, there, and he's got some of his own stuff going on. Uh, but as far as me for a favorite bet of the day, looking over at Odd Shopper, you know what's actually really nice? This kind of uh, aligns with uh, what I'm liking as well. Most of the top bets of the day that we have in Odd Shopper are Yankees to Homer today, Matt. So oh, the number wow. one MLB bet that we have of the day is Alex Verdugo plus 900 to Homer over on FanDuel. What are his odds on other books? Let's see. Oh, yeah. So this is one of the reasons that he's popping up over on FanDuel. Alex Verdugo is plus 900 to homer on FanDuel. The next best odds anywhere else is plus 650. So I'm going to go Alex Verdugo plus 900 to homer as my favorite bet of the day. Guys, thank you very much for watching. We got NBA coming on right after this. If you haven't done yet, do us a favor. Like the video. Subscribe to the YouTube channel and stick around. NBA Live before lock. And then after that, we got the playback post lock show going on. So I'll be joining Josh over there. So stick around and I'll catch you guys later. Peace out.